my friends, Grim here. I hope you're well. That opening footage was just a glimpse of what it is like to play an endgame-worthy Windy Druid. A more comprehensive and thorough gameplay video will follow in the very near future, but that's not what we're here to do today. Today we're going to talk about what an endgame Windy Druid looks like from the skill tree through to the items and the stats that that translates to. Thank you for joining me, let's jump right into it. One point into Arctic Blast as a prereq, and then you're going to max out everything subsequent to that. We have 20 points each into Cyclone Armor, Twister, Tornado, and Hurricane. Shapeshifting is and shall forever remain beautifully grayed out. No need to dip into that. And the Summoning Tree is where the remaining skill points will go. We have one point each into all of the summons in the middle part here all the way up to summon grizzly and a fully maxed out oak sage now lacer is level 95 so you may ask what on earth should we do with the remaining skill points those will be sunk into summon direwolf i put level 95's point into that why well summon direwolf is going to increase the efficacy of these wolves which are more powerful than spirit wolves and thus if you were just choosing between dire wolf and spirit wolf you'd be better advised to max him, max this skill first anyway but much more importantly than buffing either form of wolf you're also adding to the tankiness the life pool of summon grizzly so every point into summon dire wolf is going to increase the efficacy of those wolves as well as make your best summon at least in this middle part, much more tanky than it previously was. So to quickly review, you've got one point into Arctic Blast, fully maxing everything below that. That's going to account for 81 points, nothing in shape-shifting, and then one point into each of the middle parts of the summoning tree, and then every other point into Oak Sage till it's maxed, with your few remaining levels going into summon dire wolf a brief note on the summoning tree part of what makes it so useful to invest in is that these synergies benefit not only from hard points as usually is the case with most abilities in diablo 2 but from soft points as well making everything from summon grizzly to summon dire wolf to summon spirit wolf true one point wonders in this build Onto the gear, my friends, and I'd like to begin by talking about a trifecta of pieces that kind of in many ways forms the philosophical core of this build. That's Heart of the Oak, Arachnid Mesh, and Spirit. Now, all three of these are generally best in slot for a wide variety of caster builds. In particular, they're really nice for this druid build we're showcasing today because you get 35% FCR from a perfect spirit. The one I'm showing has only 34, but it still does the job. And we have 20% from Arachnid Mesh. Heart of the Oak gives us 40. 40 plus 35 plus 20 puts us at 95% FCR from three items that are already best in slot. The Druid most realistically reached and most powerful Druid FCR breakpoint is 99%. You can aim for 163, but in my opinion, that involves sacrificing very powerful choices in service of that one notch higher FCR. Possibly not worth it, but if you are comfortably at 99 and want to try a little side quest, try to see what a 163 FCR build feels like, sure, there are ways to get there. But if you're just wearing your best in slot arachnid mesh, your best in slot spirit, and your best in slot heart of the yoke, you're right at the doorstep of 99. You only need four more percent, or five more percent in my case, rocking a 34 spirit FCR. In addition to 34 FCR, the spirit we're wearing has 5 off of perfect mana at 107 and 8 magic absorb. This was self-rolled on camera. You can check out my rolling spirit runeward 15 times video for that. We've got arachnid mesh with a few points off of perfect defense. That was self-found. And we've got heart of the oak. 39 all res. This was not self-found, but it was traded for hilariously. Mentioned that in a different video as well. 
With the aforementioned gear, you only need 5% FCR from your amulet, and if you're rocking a caster amulet, you will inherently have that. Shadow Scarab is the next item I'd like to talk about. This is one of the few rare or crafted pieces that's part of this build, so of course that means you can go any number of ways with it, but to me the things that are non-negotiable are two to all druid skills, and of course the FCR that's already included. In this case we have a perfect roll of 10% regen mana, and a very very high roll of 92 to the mana pool. Those two things combined not only are synergistic with one another, but are very important for picking up one of the things that this build doesn't naturally have in the absence of gloves like Mage Fist or something like that, which is a healthy mana pool and healthy mana regen. In addition to that, we've got magic damage reduced by two, doesn't hurt, and all res 20. All res 20 is obviously a really nice roll here. Is it mandatory to get it that high? Not necessarily, but then you may have to make up for it elsewhere. In our case, this amulet gets us over the line to all of our res resistances being overcapped, as well as that FCR breakpoint comfortably reached. Since we don't need FCR or resistances from our rings, we are free and clear to wear a matching pair of Stones of Jordan, which, assuming those two things are not needed, this is comfortably, by far, the best in slot for this particular build. It also frees us up to wear pure greed on our hands. We've got chance cards, 40% better chance of getting magic items, the perfect MF roll, double up for a little bit of defense and style. War Traveler on the boots as well gives us a lot of very useful traits, but most importantly, once again, a perfect magic find roll, 50%. Let's go. Enigma does it all for us, friends. It's non-negotiable. You need to be telestomping in the endgame when you're a Windy Druid, when you need, as mentioned, to get up close and personal for your tornadoes to hit most often, for your hurricane to be most effective, and for your mercenary and minions to be attacking most efficiently. In this case, I have rolled this one in a mage plate, was using a dust shroud for a while. Both are totally valid and valuable. The mage plate is looking a little bit cooler at the moment to me, but the Dusk Shroud suits the build aesthetically in a thematic way as well. Both are tradable, both are relatively shareable, mage plate more so in either case. Last but certainly not least for Lasser's main gear slots, we come to the pelt. We've got those sweet looking green antlers. These are arguably the most stylistically desirable for a broad audience, for the average taste, I personally really like the wolf pelts, especially the ones with the blue, uh, what are they, war paint markings on it or something like that, but we'll certainly take this a lot better than the ugly bird we were using before. This is, of course, a 5 NATO. That is a non-negotiable part of an endgame Windy Druid setup. 2 to Druid skills, 3 to Tornado. We've got some other nice staff mods on here. 3 to Twister looks really impressive on paper, but remember, unlike the summons, you don't get bonuses from soft points, right? So since we don't cast Twister, that's actually not doing anything, but it is kind of there for moral support, being a part of our main elemental tree build and all that. The plus two to summon Direwolf, though, as mentioned, is really, really nice. That is not only what we're leveling, it's also got another two extra points into it, making the wolves themselves better and making the grizzly better as well, because summoning skills benefit from that type of soft point. We have 31% enhanced defense, giving it a total defense of 174. Definitely not bad. Some modest boosts of 7 to energy and 15 to life. Always useful, even if they're not over the top powerful. And I YOLO to Topaz in there. Why? Well, honestly, it was the only thing that made the most sense. If you are lacking in resistances from your gear, if you don't get enough life from your charms, for example, those are great use cases for an open socket. However, as you'll see later on, our life pool really isn't in need of any more boosting, and our resistances are overkept. Therefore, 24% better chance of magic items. Nothing wrong with that. 
personally. I'm not leaving home without a Geed's Fortune, perfect roll of 40% better magic items, a nice high gold find roll, and the lowest possible reduces all vendor prices, whatever. That just saves me from myself with too much gambling no longer being on the table. And then, of course, we have a nice host of five plus life skillers, 38, 36, 36, 35, and 32. These are genuinely part of an endgame build, and they are in keeping with my items above, in that this is a very, very nice endgame pelt, but it's not worth 20 bears. This is a 39 hodo, not a 40, etc. These things are all worthy of being called endgame, but if you're willing to pay gigantic amounts of money to squeeze that extra few points of life out of stuff like this, all the more power to you. To me, the difference is negligible relative to the price. You could kit out five other characters with similar endgame builds to this one for the cost of what it would take to make these all, you know, the typical 45 life skillers that you see in guides. It's more important to me that they're matching. Now we talked about that 99% FCR breakpoint, there's also a 99% faster hit recovery breakpoint that a telestomping Windy Druid would be best advised to reach. And because we don't happen to have any FHR on this pelt, and we're not likely to get it from any of our other sources, that leaves us with 9 all nine, in fact, of our magic small charms requiring that 5% FHR ethics. And honestly, it was a cool little project to assemble ones with coherent pairings in terms of what else they offer, and then eventually to reach all of our necessary caps with them, both in terms of resistances and in terms of FHR, and then finally to get them all to match, just like our Grand Charms, right? But we've got Fire as 10, Fire as 11, Fire as 11, Fire as 11, all four of those, as mentioned with FHR, and Fire as being the most overall desirable because it is not present, unlike the other three elements of resistance on Spirit, but we do need a little bit of help with Cold, with Poison, and with Lightning, 11, 11, 10, respect. Respectively, we've got an all res 4 small charm rounding everything out, bringing everything up over that 75% cap. And because we have been over capped, we also have a perfect roll 5 FHR, 17 to mana rounding it out. There aren't that many other desirable affixes besides mana and resistances that can pair with FHR. You can also, of course, just plug even more points into resistances. Even if they're overcapped, you can almost never be too far overcapped in case you encounter Conviction Aura from an enemy or something similar. And we're still rocking our 1929 Annie and our 1920 Torch. These are absolutely endgame worthy items, just like everything else we're showing, although they are not quite perfect, they are definitely close enough. When you're missing one point here and one point there, like literally one point off of attributes, one point off of attributes here, one point off of resistances here, one point off of resistances here, or indeed a few points off of the potential total of the life charms. When your character is this tanky, this survivable, and this much of a good generalist all-arounder that can go anywhere and do anything, you're genuinely not going to notice the difference. And I respect the min-max game and people aiming for that, but personally, I'd rather dedicate, if I should be so lucky to acquire this amount of value, like the 15 plus bears it would take to bring all these things up one more point, to breaking the bank on an even better pelt. To me, that is the true endgame holy grail for a Windy Druid, is a GG pelt. Durga is our Act 2 Might Merc, and honestly, there's no overwhelming best choice in terms of what option to take if you're going down the Act 2 path, and indeed, Act 5 Mercenaries are great with this build too. This is ironically one of the more customizable aspects of playing Windy Druid, but even if you're committed to Act 2 Mercs, you can really run a Holy Freeze. It doesn't seem like you'd need it with Hurricane, but Holy Freeze actually has a slightly wider radius and thus can kind of bring people just at the edge of 
Hurricane into Hurricane range more easily. I'm opting for Might just for more raw damage. Honestly, you really can't go wrong with any of the ones that make sense, but he is running a classic Andes Fort Reaper's Toll setup. All three options ethereal, all three very, very well above average. Our Reaper's Toll is socketed with an increased hack speed enhanced damage jewel. Neither the enhanced damage roll on the jewel nor on the base item are perfect, but both are well above average and combined to give us 263% enhanced damage with the increased attack speed in conjunction with IAS from other parts of this build, getting us to the next breakpoint, and it has 15% life stolen per hit, which is the perfect roll. Our ethereal Andes has a perfect 10% life stolen per hit, an above average 28 to strength, and a below average admittedly 110 enhanced defense, but this helm is so desirable that you're already paying quite a bit for a helm with just ethereal and below average everything. So this is a very, very good example of a strong Andy's Visage. It too is socketed with an IAS jewel taking the native 20% up to 35, and the jewel also brings fire resist, in this case, an imperfect but high roll of 22%, offsetting most but not all of the minus 30 fire res that Andy's Visage gives you, but that is still more than enough to have him well over capped in fire res, as with all other forms of resistance. Finally, his fortitude rolled live on the channel, actually, in the rolling fortitude twice video I did recently, boasting 1.125 per level to life, but much more importantly, a perfect all res roll of 30 made in a nice, ethereal sacred armor. With this setup, Durga, as mentioned, is totally overcapped with max lightning res scaling up to 80 and max poison res scaling up to 85, with also, also the highest overcapping of 262%. He's got 200, or sorry, 2,336 life points, strength of 236, dex 169, damage 850 to 5400 just about, and a nice even 4750 for defense. We're reducing damage by 7, stealing 25% life per hit, replenish life plus 7, a little bit of bonus to light radius, attack speed, breakpoint, as mentioned, has been reached, FCR does not matter, but 12% damage taken going to mana, and ignoring target defense with 33% deadly strike means that this guy, all in all, is super tanky, you barely even see his health bar move ever, is extremely powerful in his own right, and the Reaper's Toll, of course, applying Decrepify, 33% chance of applying Decrepify means that above perhaps anything else that he brings to the table, which is already quite considerable, Durga is able to break many, if not most, physical immunes that you'll encounter. And since Tornado, your main damage skill is of course physical, that makes your killing power so much the better. Speaking of Tornado's damage, it ranges from 6150 to 6457, which is not bad and very nice with this particular build. If you get a hold of a skill shrine, you'll see that max damage pop up over 7000, which is really cool to see. Hurricane's got a much narrower range and does not scale as well with levels as Tornado does, but it still clocks in at an average of 2587.5 damage per tick, and between that and the fact that it lasts 60 seconds and is a wonderful, or sorry, 50 seconds, and is a wonderful crowd control element, it really helps knit the build together as a whole. And because you're up close and personal using these skills, you need to be tanky. Cyclone armor is going to absorb fire, cold, and lightning damage to the tune of almost 3,000. And you can cast it again and again if you're getting lit up by glooms, whatever, if you, even if it's not down yet you can just keep recasting it in combat, meaning that if you're sufficiently aware of what you're up against and how your cyclone armor contributes to your survivability, you're essentially immortal against these types of foes under all but the strangest of circumstances. 
We don't need, in my opinion, to go in detail through all the stats of all the summons, because the wolves, as useful as they are, are essentially just best regarded as meat shields with upsides. Unlike the bear, the oak sage, or your cyclone armor, if the wolves go down in the middle of a tough fight, you don't really want to take away from spamming tornado, or making sure hurricane is up, or teleporting accurately to recast them. Save that for when the dust has settled. But just a few notable statistics on these summons with this particular build. The grizzly caps out at over 4,000 base life, which is really, really nice. And remember also that all of your summons and Durga and yourself get buffed from the Oak Sage, and the Oak Sage is giving a massive 215% bonus to everybody's life with a radius of just about 70 yards. As for our life and mana, they sit at 1578 and 878 respectively. But... We haven't talked about our weapon swap yet. Let's see that in action. Couple casts of the Battle Command and Battle Orders from Call to Arms takes our mana all the way up to 1250 and our life total to a massive 2674. But let's not forget, of course, about our friend the Oak Sage. Little bit of Cyclone armor just for style. And all of a sudden, well, our life total is 57, 57. All the way up from the meager 1200s to pushing 6,000. So if that doesn't show you how powerful Oak Sage combined with Call to Arms is, I don't know what will. And speaking of Call to Arms, we are fortunate enough to have a 6-6 version Crystal Sword is what I absolutely prefer with this build, stylistically I think it's cool, but much more importantly, if you're in the heat of battle and you're recasting CTA buffs and everything like that, you want a visual indicator in the chaos of the melee that you have actually switched back to your Hoto after you've cast your buffs, and it doesn't really get much different visually than a Crystal Sword versus a Flail. But the CTA is actually by far that at this level anyway of being a 6-6 six -six, is actually by far the most expensive item that we have here. Of course, we've got another spirit on swap as well. So those are the numbers, guys. That's what you can expect from a build like j this. Just as a too long didn't watch, we'll summarize here at the end. We've got a rare five NATO pelt with other useful modifiers socketed with a P Topaz. We've got that trinity of 95% FCR comprised of Heart of the Oak, Arachnid Mesh, and Spirit, all with very high rolls. We've got the rest of the FCR for the breakpoint made up by a plus two to all skills amulet. Remember, you do want all skills, not just elemental, due to how powerful soft points into summons are. We've got Enigma to teleport around and do all the magic finding. We've got the plus skills from that as well. We've got perfect rolled double up chances and perfect rolled war travelers, mentioning only the MF rolls, of course, for our gloves and boots, giving us a ton of magic find potential. Stones of Jordan on the rings. Five high life roll elemental skillers plus a perfect MF Geats fortune in the large, uh, grand charm slot. 1929 Annie. 1920 torch sandwiching nine fc fhr plus all res or one res or mana small charms leading us to be overcapped on everything relevant in terms of breakpoints and resistances we are 334 gold fine 249 magic fine thanks in large part to the options here in we have Durga rocking Andy's Visage, Fortitude, and the Reaper's Toll. And all in all, as mentioned before, you're very tanky, you're very survivable, you're very cool. The quality of life is nice, because between Hurricane and your summons, stragglers get caught up very, very easily between your army and your AoE, and Tornado absolutely melts people's faces off. So, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this breakdown of what an endgame Windy Druid build looks like. And next time out, we're going to take this guy for a spin. Take him through all different types of areas and see what we can do. Thank you again for hanging out, and I'll talk to you soon.